So let's discuss a specific type of nucleophilic substitution that involves the alkylation of ammonia and amines. This is not a practical way of synthesizing alkylated amines because it's very difficult to control. The chemistry is really straightforward. There's just going to be a series of SN2 reactions. Remember SN2 is a concerted nucleophilic attack and loss of a leaving group or heterolysis. So if we look at the slide in front of us, we see that the lone pair on ammonia attacks the alpha carbon of ethyl bromide to make a nitrogen carbon bond and there is heterolysis between the carbon bromine bond so bromide is the leaving group in a successive proton transfer reaction we neutralize the product to produce a primary amine you could envision bromide being sufficiently alkaline to remove the proton you could envision another ammonia molecule being able to remove the proton. The problem is is that the product is more alkaline than the reactant. So ethyl amine, because it has a weak electron donating carbon, and you can envision this because carbon is less electronegative, or excuse me, is more electronegative than the hydrogens that are bonded to it and so it can weakly through induction donate electron density. So ethylamine is a stronger base and a stronger nucleophile than ammonia. So this is going to immediately react with another ethyl bromide and the process will be repeated. So we can't stop it at a primary amine. Notice the product distribution. We'll get some secondary amine and some tertiary amine and even some ammonium ion, a quaternary ammonium salt. So mechanistically, the problem is that the product is a stronger nucleophile than the reactant. Now we can utilize this kind of chemistry in a process known as the Hoffman elimination. So let's take a look at the Hoffman elimination quickly. So the reactant in a Hoffman elimination is just a primary amine. So what we are going to do is we are going to start with, I'll just go ahead and use their example, sec butyl amine. I'm not showing any stereochemistry for this process. So let's just go ahead and combine a few things. Let's do R 2 amino butane. And of course, let's convince ourselves that this is R, priority 1, priority 4, priority 2, priority 3. That's moving in a clockwise manner when the low priority is oriented away from me as the viewer. And I connect 1 to 2 to 3 by a clockwise movement. So this is R. 2 amino butane. Remember, amino butane should be one word. 
Let's react this with an excess of methyl iodide. When we react this with an excess of methyl iodide, I'm going to obtain the quaternary ammonium ion. We have a really active leaving group, one that will be very stable because it will be neutralized. Normally, in an elimination reaction, we would produce the more substituted alkene. So I have a couple of beta hydrogens that can be removed. Again, remember, this is the alpha carbon. This is a beta carbon. This is a beta carbon. This would be a gamma carbon. Beta hydrogens can be removed. So this bond would break. I would make a pi bond. This bond would break. I would have a leaving group. This reaction does not yield the more substituted alkene, which we call the Zaychev product. The Zaychev product would be E2-butene. the less thermodynamically stable alkene because it has less hyperconjugation would be 1-butene. It's neither E nor Z because on this side of the double bond the two groups are the same. They're both hydrogens. Unexpectedly this is the major product so let's examine why that is the case. So what I want to do is looks, let's look down the C2, C3 bond axis, which I'm going to highlight in orange, for the elimination of the beta hydrogen that would lead to the expected major product. So this is C2, this is C3. And if I rotate and look down this alpha beta bond, the quaternary ammonium group will be up and to the right in the Newman projection. The hydrogen will be to the left in the Newman projection. And a methyl group straight down in the Newman projection. And then on the back carbon, which of course will be C3, we'll have a methyl group straight up. And then two hydrogens, one down and to the left and one down and to the right. We have a major problem here. This methyl group and this bulky ammonium ion are sterically clashed one with another. Said another way, this is not the most stable conformation. The most stable conformation will be when the two biggest, bulkiest, fattest groups on those adjacent carbons have a dihedral angle of 180 degrees relative to one another. Well, we can do this. We can rotate around this bond. So I'm going to hold the front carbon steady. and I'm going to rotate the back carbon and now I have the CH3 
anti to this quaternary ammonium ion. And now I have a hydrogen here and I have a hydrogen here. That's a problem because now I do not have a beta hydrogen that is anti-periplanar to the leaving group. When I do have a hydrogen that's anti-periplanar to the leaving group, I have a big steric clash. Now let's look at the Newman projection if I look down the C1, C2 bond axis. So on C1, everything is just a hydrogen. So I'm going to do this. And then on C2, it'll look much the same as it did previously. So I have, on C2, I have the quaternary amine, I have a hydrogen, and I have an ethyl group. Notice that all of the atoms on the C1 are hydrogens. There is no bulk. I have the anti-periplanar arrangement. This will easily yield the E2 elimination product. So the Newman projection will predict the major product is what we call the Hoffman product. In this case, the Hoffman product is the major product, as opposed to the Zaycheff product, which normally predominates because it's a more stable alkene but the more stable alkene cannot be formed because of the geometric requirement of an E2 elimination.